Hello and welcome to the Gastric Health Show. My name is Dawn Boxel and I am your host. Today we are back for another episode and we are covering Regain. But first and foremost, we need to kind of cover that these podcasts are not intended for medical advice. They are for educational purposes only. And we would love for you to share these podcasts with your friends and other weight loss surgery patients that are in different closed or secret Facebook groups that you feel might be beneficial to um, some information that they have been seeking. And we are excited that our 30-day, next 30-day class will be soon here in the fall. Um, But first, we are going to be having our free 10-day Back on Track Challenge that will begin on September 17th. So we would love for you to join us. You can go on WLSGutHealth.com and register, and we can help you get back on track and get you off of the package processed junk food, the sugar, the artificial sweetener. We can help you accomplish all of that. And um, we are um, excited to have that um, coming up here soon. So get registered for the next class. And today's topic is our hormones to blame for regain after weight loss surgery. So this is something that maybe is not talked a lot about, but there are some things that need to be thought about when it comes to hormones. And many times I find that in the weight loss surgery community, the talk is on ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, and leptin, and, and those levels being altered. But as the research has kind of evolved, Um, it really does show evidence of other areas that you do have to be aware of and stay on top of and just, you know, know that is being evaluated. So, so this is something that I'm, you know, definitely excited to share with you and hopefully it will give you some things to think about. And if you've ever been on our website, which is WLSGutHealth.com, um, you have probably read a lot of information about how weight loss after weight loss surgery isn't just about the size of your pouch or just focusing on calories, um, you know, eating less calories and exercising more. And we're not a pusher or believer of that. And it's a lot of the information that I've learned on topics like this. And when it comes to the world of functional medicine, which is, you know, kind of where I have my little twist, um, that is definitely an area that this is highly thought of and this is highly utilized. And I always, you know, kind of allude to this that functional medicine has more tools in their toolbox and this is part of it. So, Today we're gonna cover those hormones and go into a little bit deeper detail on these. So you have some more solutions and you have some more topics that you can have conversations with your doctor on. And I do have links on the resources that um, I'll cover here. There'll be links to those, those websites and that information, that content, that will be very helpful for you. So, What hormones do you have to think about? So there are four hormones that I'm going to be, or four categories of hormones that I'm gonna talk about. Insulin, I'm gonna talk talk about thyroid, I'm gonna talk about cortisol, and then all the sex hormones. So let's start with insulin. And insulin is something that most typically may or may not really be evaluated by your family doctor. Most typically, you're gonna have to ask for that lab to be drawn. Unless you have diabetes or you know metabolic syndrome or, or something in that area that, or they think that you might, then that would be why they would be checking that. But this also can help you understand what's happening with your foods and your food choices and what's happening with 
why you're gaining weight or you're not able to lose weight or call we'll call it weight loss resistance so when your insulin is the ideal reference range or the ideal range for insulin is two to five and the reference range will go up to 10. So some doctors will let you go up to 10, but that's not ideal. Ideal is more two to five in the functional medicine world. That's where um, we want that insulin to be, to be between two and five. It's above, if it's above that, then your, your body is starting to um, store more fat. And usually it's in the middle. So in your belly or your abdomen area, the midline, um, that's where you'll find that you're, you're carrying more fat. And it can also, just by having your insulin higher, it can cause more inflammation in your body. And you can know if you have inflammation in your body by checking a, a lab called CRP, which is your C-reactive protein. And that can you know, give you evidence if there's inflammation that's you know, contributing. Anytime you gain weight in the middle though, you're automatically increasing inflammation. And it's just all kind of a vicious cycle. So it's, it's something that it's good to evaluate and it's giving you information saying, I'm eating too many sugars and carbs because what happens is when your pancreas has to put out insulin because of all the glucose or sugar or carbs that you're eating and it is being overworked. And so those excess sugar and carbs that you're eating is causing that insulin to continue to rise. So that's where you want to make sure that you you know, are changing the foods that you're eating, um, but you're monitoring it, making sure that you're in that two to five reference range. So definitely work with your practitioner and getting those levels checked, your insulin or your CRP, especially if you've regained weight. And then you're gonna know, oh gosh, my health is being impacted. And until I get those numbers down, I'm probably not gonna see the weight loss results that I want. So, so make sure you're checking those or you're having your doctor check those. Then the next one is your thyroid. So this, I will say, is very interesting. I see a lot of weight loss surgery patients that come back very symptomatic for this. And I can tell you this from a personal level. This is a personal experience that I had that, I, that led me into functional medicine. And it's mainly because I went for so many years undiagnosed you know, going to my doctor, getting the blood test that I'm supposed to be getting, but I wasn't doing my part. I wasn't asking for the results. I was not, I was relying on them and trusting them to be treating me appropriately and looking at the levels correctly, but I just didn't know. And it took me a long time um, with symptoms just getting worse and worse and nothing, nope, everything's good, Every, you're, everything is fine. And I'm just like, no, but it's really not fine. And so it wasn't until I found a functional medicine practitioner that I was able to get the, um, the you know, all of the testing um, completed that then I really found the evidence that I was hypothyroid. So at the, you'll find at the bottom of this podcast, there's going to be a link for an article and it's written by Aviva Ram. I love her article because it, it goes into detail about how to get the correct testing and what should be tested. And she, um, I actually saw her at a conference several years ago and she, she was fabulous to see in person, but then this article popped up a few years later in, uh, on a website that I am, you know, get newsletters from on hypothyroidism and this audience is it's she has a huge this blog has a huge huge audience so she attracts pretty um high profile practitioners to post on her on her blog and dr aviva ram posted and she actually is so super smart um she was actually in college at 15 and um, you know, has a very unique, you know, 
I guess you want to say path that she took, but she ended up graduated from um, Yale Medical School. I don't know what year, but it was after she had done um, some other things. And so she's, she's very smart, but she's very good at, you know, explaining how we should be testing and what parameters, what reference ranges you should be following. And, and I, will, I will encourage patients to, to talk to their family doctor or talk, find a practitioner, get with a functional medicine practitioner to listen to them and treat them based on what their symptoms are and looking at the blood work together. And, and that's what this, this article will do. It will help you identify kind of those reference ranges, the sweet spot for you so that you feel good. And um, so I would say that's the most important thing. If you're having issues with weight gain, but then you're also, you know, you're having hair loss, you're constipated, you're tired all the time, your nails are really brittle and, and um, soft, and weak and and you just have kind of some of those signs just google it you can see all the the signs for hypothyroidism if you google it and if you have a few of those then i would just have the conversation with your doctor and say okay can we test my thyroid to make sure that it's okay and um, most practitioners are going to they rely on the TSH or the thyroid stimulating hormone, but you also have to have the full thyroid panel. And if you read the article by Aviva Ram, she goes into detail on that, so you know exactly what to expect and what, um, which labs should be on this full panel. So, so some of the things that can impact your thyroid that you may not think about, but this will help you kind of, you know, build your lifestyle and your choices so that it protects it. So stress can alter your thyroid levels and lead you to hypothyroid if it's not under control, if it gets out of control. And, and that is something that I have to watch. My functional medicine doc watches, and that is something that we watch every three months for me. And we know where my levels are because we stay on top of my cortisol and then my DHEA. And we're making sure that, um, you know, I'm keeping my stress in check um, because that's going to impact my effectiveness of my, the thyroid medicine getting into my cells and, or having enough of them. And then another thing that can impact your thyroid is heavy metals. So having excess heavy metals in your body can um, prevent you from having the thyroid level where it should be. And the other thing is nutrient deficiency. So you gotta think of vitamin D, selenium, zinc, iodine, um, and the omega-3 fatty acids. All of those can, um, if they're deficient, can um, cause problems with your thyroid. So vitamin D, I would say most weight loss surgery patients are taking some extra vitamin D that is outside of um, what's already in your multivitamin and your calcium, because that is important. And it does depend on what your level is, and it does depend on where you live, because of the amount of sunshine that you're exposed to and how well your body is converting that. Because some people genetically do not um, absorb and convert the vitamin D. So, so you may get adequate sunshine and you may take vitamins well, but genetically your body cannot do well with it. So, so that's where you gotta make sure those levels are checked and that you're taking those D so that it, it's not low. Um, the other one is selenium. This one, um, I always think of Brazil nuts. So this is something that you can eat. It's like four to six a week Brazil nuts, and you'll get enough selenium and potentially enough iodine, but maybe not 100% all the iodine, but um, you'll at least get some. Um, then the other thing is zinc, and that you can think of pumpkin seeds. So making sure if you're having nuts and seeds that you include pumpkin seeds in that because that will give you um, plenty of zinc. And then iodine, this you can be low in because of excess fluoride and chlorine. So think of your water. So if your um, municipal water supply is not great 
if you live in an area where they um, don't have you know um, great water and they're having to use a lot of chlorine or they add a lot of fluoride to the water that could be impacting your iodine level which would then impact your thyroid so um, iodine comes from iodized salt but if you don't consume a lot of that that would interfere then also um, it comes from seaweed those type of things most of us don't eat that i know i at different times i have had to take iodine um, supplements to help support my thyroid so that may be a thing that is necessary too if you talk to your practitioner and then the omega-3 fatty acids I will say this one is really hard for most people to get by diet because you need about 12 ounces of fatty fish a week to meet your omega-3 fatty acid um, requirements. So most of us probably don't eat that much, but if you do a fatty fish, awesome. Just keep doing it. If you don't, then I would say fish oil should be your friend and start taking some fish oil every day. Um, something that you will want to think about that you may not like to think about is, but there is some evidence, um, quite a bit of it, the gluten um, interferes with your body's ability to process the thyroid um, very well. So that, you know, gluten intolerance can definitely make a, um, a big factor in your thyroid being normal. So this is something that I'm really good at and I like avoiding um, gluten because it helps manage my thyroid better. So if I manage my stress better and if I'm um, avoiding gluten like I should, then I you know, my thyroid stays right where it should be. And then the only thing that you have to watch, and since I'm a big proponent of, of um, vegetables, especially those cruciferous vegetables, um, really monitoring how much raw cruciferous vegetables you get. So I love for you to eat them, but not in the raw form. So when you're doing smoothies, I would not put a ton of kale into my smoothie. I would probably go with spinach or cilantro or parsley or arugula. I would probably pick some of those greens to be in or mustard greens or something would be fine in your smoothie. Um, if you think you have thyroid disease or if you already do have thyroid disease, um, I, would, I would not put so much in those smoothies. And then if I'm going to have kale, I'm going to saute it or I'm going to make it into kale chips. And that helps. So you just have to watch your intake and make sure that it's not um, excess. You're not doing a lot of it every day. So that kind of covers the insulin and the thyroid. So the next is cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And stress can be anything real, uh, a real stressor, like you have a gun being pointed at your head, or it can be an imagined stress where you think your boss doesn't like you, or you think that your, um, you know, your kids are getting in trouble, or that your spouse is, um, you know, doesn't like you, or any of those type of things, um, those imagined that we kind of formulate in our brain that we kind of let our, you know, our thoughts take over. So it could be anything that's real or imagined um, threat to your body or your ego that you, um, you know, you, you feel like you have control over, you don't. So, so that doesn't matter. However you perceive it is um, the reality of what's happening in your body. And that will raise your cortisol level and, and, if left untreated, it will then lead to higher blood sugars, it will lead to belly fat, it will increase your blood pressure, it will increase your cholesterol, and then it also causes you to lose muscle. So, so those are things that stress is pretty powerful in. And it also, you know, contributes to weight gain. So because it's causing all these imbalances. So you have to remember that you got to get good at managing your stress all the time. And we can't control the stress that we are given, but we can control how we react to it. 
So make sure that you are working hard at doing some meditations. I really do like the Stop, Breathe, and Think app. It's a free app that does some meditations um, you know, with you so that you kind of get that stress hormone, that fight or flight mode down and that you can um, manage your stress better. Um, you can work on your thinking so that you, you know, don't let your, your thoughts get out of control. The 30 day class, I would highly recommend our 30 day class. We have a whole week on this and helping you improve your thoughts and your thinking overall, because it, we go into detail of how it's so powerful in your weight and um, how you maintain your ability to maintain your weight. So I would highly recommend that if you, the 30 day class, if you really want to get to the root and get some solutions to help you overcome um, this whole issue of stress. And then yoga, yoga is awesome, that it really does shut off that fight or flight mode and can really change your brain. There's really cool research on this and evidence showing that it can decrease your stress um, by doing, you know, one yoga routine. So try to, to think outside the box, especially if you're a man, um, don't be afraid of doing yoga. My husband loves to do yoga and, um, enjoys the abilities that it, it um, provides for him because it allows his, you know, him to strengthen, but yet stretch those muscles so that he is more flexible. And as we get older, um, it is something that you have to think about. We have to be able to care for ourselves as we get older. And that's, you know, being able to get up out of a chair and go to the bathroom on our own and just cook for ourselves and have that range of motion and, and flexibility that um, we lose as we age. So yoga is great for that. So not only is it going to shut down the, the stress, it's going to help improve your flexibility for um, as you age. So, so definitely paying attention to your stress levels so that that cortisol is um, not too high. I know when I get mine checked, <laughs> it's um, I'm usually a normal to... Um, high normal is where I fall. So I have to be careful um, all every three months that I'm really paying attention to my stress level and making sure that those numbers aren't getting to the high. It'd be high normal, but it's above um, the normal is where I got to keep it out of. So that's, I have to work hard at it. I'm just not great at it. And some of that is my genetics and, and, and how things, um, my body's ability to to do things is not great so if i don't have all the support there then it makes it hard for me to do that my body to do that so so that is something you got to think about because that is going to put pounds on you so if you are if stress is out of control you got to think about okay is is my blood sugar increasing my blood pressure is um, you know, the belly fat that's accumulating because of stress and nothing else. And that's what you have to know. Or is, is all this stress leading to your thyroid being off? And um, then if it's accumulating fat around your mid, is it around your midsection? Is it, is it causing your insulin to be higher? So it's like you can start seeing, hopefully, that these are all connected. And when one is off, then you're going to easily get these other hormones off and out of balance. And that's what your body doesn't like. It doesn't like to be out of balance. And then the last one is sex hormones. So think of like your estrogen, your progesterone, your testosterone, all those, we all have those, whether we're male or female. It's just females have more, more estrogen and males have more testosterone. So that is kind of the dif differentiating factor between males and females um, when it comes to the sex hormones. 
But many people don't realize, especially weight loss surgery patients, I find they don't understand the connection because conventionally, it really hasn't been um, looked at this way. In functional medicine, this is a very known and well-known thing um, to monitor and really know, have options to help. So excess estrogen will really increase your cravings for sugar, refined carbs, and even alcohol. So those three things, when your estrogen is rising and getting out of normal um, reference ranges, you may find it nearly impossible to stop eating the sweets or the carbs or the junk or quit drinking alcohol. Um, And then it just feeds on it. So the more alcohol you drink, the higher your estrogen goes. And it just keeps going and going. And the more you crave the alcohol, the more you drink it. The more you drink it, the more you raise your your estrogen. And it just, it's a vicious, vicious cycle. So you can see how weight loss surgery patients can easily get addicted to alcohol, or at least I can, um, especially for females. Or if a male, if their estrogen level is too high, um, maybe that could be a contributor. I don't know and I don't know that that's the the root cause of why alcohol is such an issue with weight loss surgery patients but I would be I would love to do a research study on this for sure I was talking to our nurse practitioner about that this last week at work and and she was like oh my gosh that would be an awesome study to do because it is um, such an issue for our patients so just know that if you are really craving those carbs and those sugars and the alcohol that you need to get your estrogen checked you need to have those levels evaluated how do you know if your estrogen is elevated uh, for females it can be breast tenderness fluid retention really bad pms um, you have fibroids or heavy uh, menstrual uh, cycles or heavy menstrual bleeding. And um, for men, it's more of you lose body hair and you have kind of that beer belly and you start having man boobs and you age, you start aging really fast. So those are kind of some signs of too much estrogen in your system and that can totally put pounds on you and i've lived this myself um i'm 49 uh and a half oh that's scary to say (laughs) and and so perimenopause is is here and and i will say that that excess estrogen um easily put last year uh 10 to 15 pounds on me just like that out of the blue it was just like I had all these crazy, crazy symptoms. And I'm so I'm emailing my doctor. I'm like, okay, here's my list of, of symptoms. And she's like, I think it's your estrogen. So we did some blood tests and we're like, yep, it had jumped 200 points. And I had all that. I had all those symptoms. I And it was really weird because we were on vacation. And I don't drink, you know, even every week alcohol, but we were on vacation and we were drinking I don't want to say every day, but pretty close to every day. And um, it was weird. My my alcohol tolerance was different. It was higher. I could drink more alcohol and I didn't feel that I was having the same. um, It wasn't, how do I want to say it? I was definitely intoxicated, but I didn't feel I was intoxicated. So it was it was a, a weird experience, and that was estrogen. Estrogen was allowing me to consume more alcohol and not feel like I was um, having the same effects. So it's very scary. It's a very very scary place to be. And so you know, I just had you just you know went back to not drinking alcohol because it was just too scary to me to to have that feeling of. Um, you know, you always knew when to stop. It was like you have a few drinks over several hours and it's like um, you were able to drink it faster. So it was weird. It was just the craziest thing. But, you know, if you don't know those connections, how would you know to ask your doctor to check those things? So so that will make a huge difference. So it, you're going to put on pounds if you're, you know, eating more of the sugar and refined carbs and the alcohol, you're going to put on pounds. 
So, so you need to pay attention to what your body's telling you. If you are having breast tenderness and you are having horrible PMS and, and heavy menstrual cycles, there's a reason something is off. Um, so that's where you've got to um, get the right testing done. Um, also, um, low testosterone can cause weight gain. And ironically, a couple weeks ago, I had a patient that she was talking, she had come back in because she's trying to get back on track. So I scheduled her for two weeks after our initial visit to kind of see where she was in the process of getting her plan and program in place. And we got off on a topic of hormones and she said, well, over a year ago, I was diagnosed with low testosterone. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that causes weight gain right there. Um, Cause she had put on, I wanna say 20 pounds in a really short amount of time. And she really hadn't changed much. Now, um, I don't know what her estrogen was, so maybe she didn't feel like she was eating those things, but she was. Um, but when your testosterone is low, it, it will make you put the pounds on. So, so that's something you've got to think about is making sure that those hormones are at the right levels that they're supposed to be. Um, so definitely getting with a healthcare practitioner that will listen to you, listen to your symptoms, and do the right testing um, will help you uh, really, you know, kind of evaluate where you're at, at your baseline with where you're struggling. The next thing to think about is gut imbalances. That can totally mess up your sex hormones and you can, um, you know, have gut imbalances in those alone. Certain bacteria in your gut will, will actually increase the quickness of, the, of absorption of estrogen. So um, beta glucuronidase is one that it will, your body will just, um, uh, it will increase the absorption of estrogen. So for me, that was one thing that was elevated and I, you know, we have to, we had to fix that problem so that I would, my, my estrogen could get in control because that was contributing to it. So it's a whole package deal. You've got to look at the whole, your whole body. It's not just one thing and not just one pill is going to fix it all. You got to change your diet, you got to change your lifestyle, and then you got to add some supplements if needed, um, which we did. You know, there's some um, very powerful in my book, they feel they work very powerfully for me in my um, getting rid of the estrogen. There are supplements you can take that will help get rid of the estrogen faster so that it will support you during that, during that time. Because sometimes that's hard to make those changes when, um, when everything's so out of balance and so out of whack. So getting your gut back in balance and getting on the right types of probiotics and doing the right thing and, and, and addressing a leaky gut if you have one, um, that will make a huge difference in um, you know, those gut imbalances improving that. And then the last one in your sex hormones is genetically how you detoxify them. So some people will not detoxify estrogen well. Their body genetically cannot get rid of it. It doesn't have... Um, the right amount, how do I want to say this simply? Um, it, it's just, it's you're out of balance in that, so you genetically cannot um, remove the estrogen as quickly as you need to. Some people remove it really rapidly, so they might have uh, um, issues with low estrogen, and then other people remove it slowly, um, and so they get a buildup of estrogen. So they've got to support that detoxification in order for that estrogen to leave. So, so you have to really pay attention to your symptoms, um, partner with a really good practitioner that's going to listen to you and that you can you know, talk to them, go to a visit or email or text or however you can communicate with them um, on your symptoms so that they know what labs to check. And that's where I would say functional medicine um, really just, it, they kill it. They are the leader in this because they know what to, they know what to order. And if you, um, 
you know, haven't ever gone to a functional medicine practitioner, I would strongly urge you to find one because they will really help balance this whole picture. So insulin, thyroid, cortisol, and all your sex hormones, they look at that whole package and they treat you as a whole person as it all works as one system. Not as, okay, I'm going to send you away to a counselor for your um, high stress and I'm going to send you to an endocrinologist for your thyroid. And then I'm gonna, and for your insulin. For your insulin and your thyroid, you're gonna go see an endocrinologist. And then for your sex hormones, I'm gonna send you to an OBGYN. No, if you go to a functional medicine doctor, guess what? They can do the whole thing as a family practice doctor. That's all mine is. Mine is a family practice doctor and she does the whole package deal. We watch my insulin, we watch my thyroid, we watch my cortisol and my, all my stress hormones and my sex hormones, we watch all that. So get with a functional medicine practitioner if, if, yours is, if what you're doing is not working. If your conventional doctor is, awesome. That is, that is um, you are very fortunate that they will look at this whole package. They will look at your insulin, your thyroid, your stress hormones, and all your sex hormones because um, that is not very typical these days. So, so hopefully I have given you guys some things to think about with the hormone area. And I will tell you, if you put on pounds, you know, 20 pounds pretty quickly within a few months and you really didn't feel like significant things changed, I would encourage you to get with a good health practitioner and really look at these um, areas of your hormones as a potential driver. Maybe it won't be the thing, but maybe it could be the thing. I don't know, but I want you to think about it. I want you to explore all your options and rule these out. Um, it's too simple to um, do some blood tests and figure out if this is not the, the problem or not for you. So I hope this helps. Um, please share this podcast with any of your friends or any other groups that maybe, um, you know, they're dealing with regain and they're just not getting the results that they thought they would, or they had weight loss surgery and they really didn't lose much weight. They just never got much off. It could be some of these hormones. So share it with all those people and your friends so that they have the, the ideas and some some topics to have conversations with their doctors on that can get them going down the right path so that they um, can get the results that they were hoping for after weight loss surgery. Mm -hmm.